You ready, Sanjay? Yeah. Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Comprehensivist Wednesdays. This is done in conjunction with the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society. Uh, tonight is Neuroscience Wednesday. Uh, we do this once a month. And tonight we'll be exploring the multimodality of the mind, specifically aphantasia, uh, and as well as how it relates to large language models and artificial intelligence. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to our host, Sanjay. Okay, uh, thanks, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, so we're, we're, we've been uh, looking at uh, various aspects of, of the, um, particularly the human brain, uh, slash mind, but also animals in general. And one of the techniques we've been using um, for several months is to do comparisons with uh, the artificial intelligence types of neural networks. And, and most of you are familiar with the idea that um, neural networks, whether they're artificial or biological, have a lot of similarity and, and a lot of um, uh, shared attributes, characteristics, and, and behaviors. Um, and um, in terms of the design of, of these artificial systems, they are different, but fundamentally at the lowest level, the similarities are, are uh, strong enough that they, um, they, and that's one of the reasons why they exhibit uh, similar behaviors to, uh, to animal brains. And, and now the, the more complicated um, AI models, the uh, LLMs, the large language models, they're showing a lot of uh, promise and, and uh, you know, similarity to how we uh, communicate using language. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, another aspect of, of neural networks or brains in general. Um, and that is this idea called multimodality. Um, and multimodality just simply means that um, uh, in, in, in the animal brain, um, we have multiple modes of getting information. Every brain is, is an information processing system. And uh, the information can come in through multiple sensory streams, so a visual stream, audio, um, tactile, you know, skin touch, temperature, all of that. Each of those are separate streams of input in, that go into the brain. Um, and the information that it collects comes from the external world, but also it collects a lot of information from the internal world, meaning from our physical body. Um, and from our physical body, there are actually two sides to it. One is, is our, our viscera, our, our primary body. And another part of the internal world is from the mind itself. So for example, memories, or states of consciousness or states of mind um, within the brain. So all of these things put together are information that go into the brain and they're processed um, inside this very complicated neural network. And then there may be sometimes um, outputs in the form of communication. It could be behavior or movement in our body. Um, it could be a digestive system. It may be a control over our body. For example, our muscle, um, like I said, digestive system it could be a change to a heart rate. Um, you know, many things like that. It could be uh, storing something as a memory. For example, if we're reading a text, if we're reading something, you know, a child is memorizing the multiplication table and they're reading it on a piece of paper over and over. And the goal is to memorize it. So the result, the output may be a memorization that basically puts that information back into the brain itself. So there are many, many complicated aspects to how this information flows into and out of the brain. Um, and, and it does it through multiple sensory uh, uh, systems, so multi, multiple modes, multiple modalities. So let me start the, um, um, the slide uh, presentation I have. So hopefully everyone can uh, can see this. And um, okay, so um, first, um, you know, again, information uh, is one of the things that's necessary for us to survive. It's a very important part of um, uh, our survival in the world. Um, the brain is always collecting, the animal brain and human brain is always collecting data. Even when we're asleep, um, it is collecting data about, um, for example, it may be um, something as simple as our balance system, you know, that even though we're sleeping, if we're sleeping in a, in a moving, um, you know, for example, if an animal is, is in a tree, um, on a branch, you know, many animals tend to sleep in trees and on branches. So if they're sleeping on a branch, um, their brain will still be collecting data because if that branch is swaying in the wind, um, their body needs to know uh, whether they're balanced, how they're uh, positioned on the tree branch or not. Even if their eyes are closed, even if most of their sensory systems are turned off, 
their system of, of proprietary system, their, their, their balance system, these systems will still be active in collecting data because it doesn't want to fall out of the tree. So even when we're asleep, at, you know, when we have lower uh, states of consciousness, the brain still collects uh, data, but it may collect less data. It may focus in on only some types of data which are necessary. For example, even when we're asleep, our digestive system may still be working. So it may still be collecting information and data from our within our body about digestion, about our heart rate, things like that, about very simple things, um, and, and process that type of information. And using this data, then, the brain is always um, turning it into higher levels of understanding. So um, from data, it goes to what we would call information. Um, that information then um, gives us a symbolic representation of, of things, um, you know, either the body or external to the body. And many of these, these uh, at this level, it usually refers to the physical world, the physical body or the external world, physical aspects of the, the external world. And then as it collects uh, and processes that information more, that symbolic uh, representation of the information will be turned into uh, what we call a cognitive understanding. So for example, there may be symbols um, that uh, are recognized. Um, so for example, the, the fact that you're in a tree branch, um, the symbol may be the orientation of your body, whether you're sitting in a tree branch, whether you're, whether you're lying flat, um, and some animals, they, they are upside down on a tree branch. They may hang from their tail and their physical body and their head may be upside down. So that is a symbolic uh, representation of your relative position relative to, to the tree or the tree branch or even relative to, to the ground. So that's a symbolic nature of where you are, your orientation space. That's a symbolic uh, form of information and gives you an understanding. If you began sleeping upside down in the tree, as, as um, you know, many um, uh, primates do, uh, some primates do and, and many apes do, um, and uh, even um, animals like bats, they, they sleep upside down, um, not using their tail, but using their legs, their, their feet, they, they grab onto something, they um, literally sleep uh, head down. So that may be important for that animal to, to be aware of the position of their body, the fact that they have not fallen off or that the branch that they were on, the branch didn't fall down. Um, they, they can't control the branch, so they need to know whether they're still in a safe position. So there's a certain level of information um, and understanding that they have. And then as the mind um, and brain continues its processing, it will get a, a greater understanding um, of how they're, uh, in fact, in the real, in the world, in, in reality, in a sense of reality. And that will help um, that animal or organism to take action. So, for example, if the animal fell out of the tree branch, it will need to take action. And probably the first thing that will happen is automatically it will awaken from its state of sleep if it was sleeping. Um, and that action of, of awakening will actually uh, drive a lot of other things. What it will do, because when you're asleep, again, while you are collecting data, you're collecting a reduced set of data. So after you've awake, awakened, um, your mind will start to waken up other types of modalities of, of systems um, that collect data. So for example, not only your balance system will awaken, but your eyes will open up and all of a sudden you'll begin to collect information using your eyes and maybe your, your ears, which you were not collecting as much. I mean, your ears you probably were collecting a little bit just kind of to, to pay attention to threats or distant noises, but you weren't paying full attention. But after you're awake, you'll start to pay much more attention to all of these things. So that may be one of the actions you do. And that gives you a more cohesive understanding of, of the world around you, where you are, what's happening. And from that, you may be able to um, uh, to uh, plan actions on what you need to do. Again, you just woke up. So the action you uh, take may be to go back into the tree, climb the tree again and go back up. And maybe it's still nighttime. You don't haven't had a good enough rest, so you need to sleep some more. So that may be the action to climb the tree again. Or it may be that you fell when it's close to morning time, the sun is up, starting to rise. And so you no longer need to sleep and you need to do something else. In addition to that, um, what you're doing is you're also, um, or, or the brain, especially advanced brains like a human brain, um, tend to create a model of the world that they're in. And a model is, is one way to look at it is an understanding of how things work. Um, and this allows us to plan things. So for example, if you um, need to reclimb that tree again, then you know that uh, in the model of, of your mind, um, you have a representation of what a tree is. And a tree has a, has a 
excuse me, a tree, tree trunk. And that tree trunk can be used to climb. And your body has already learned because you grew up in this environment. Your body already knows how to climb the tree and your mind has to and already knows how to control your limbs to help you climb that tree. And, and your brain would, would use your cerebellum, uh, a distinct part of your brain to help you do that. And then you climb it, you reach into the canopy again, you find a branch that seems to be safe and stable. You go down to the, to the midpoint of that branch and you might go back to sleep. Um, and so that would be, you know how the tree works, you know that the branches spread from the center of the tree outward. You know that, that if you go too far to the, to the edge of the branch, to the tip of the branch, it will be more unstable. The branch may, may um, lean and even break. So these are things you know about the model of a tree. Um, you also know that, that the, in the model of the world that there are predators out there. So you probably don't want to fall out of the tree too much. So you want to remain in a safe area of the tree. Um, so all of these things will help you to plan your action and where you go into the tree uh, to fall asleep again. So um, and, and as you woke up, you know, after you fell down, you woke up and, and more of your sensory systems became active. Um, what you're actually doing is you're also uh, re-updating the model, the, the current model of, the, of the, the world around you. So when you fell asleep, it was nighttime or it may have been um, dusk um, when you fell asleep. You know, it may have been a little bit of light, but now it's it's maybe uh, deep at night when the sun is not, uh, the sun is definitely not there, but not even the moon is there. So it may be very, very dark, very difficult to see. So you have to update your model, your mental representation of, of where you are in the world, of what's happening around you. And so now that you're, you're on the ground, um, you need to realize that you're on the ground. So you're updating your model of the world in the sense that you, your physical location now is no longer in the tree, it's on the ground. You have to be aware that what time it is, you have to become uh, aware of, again, the world around you that, again, if you smell a predator or a certain type of animal, uh, you know, far in the distance because of the wind blowing or something, then you need to be aware of that, that predator being there. And then that will cause you to take quicker action because then you're, you're actually in a, in a possible state of danger. So you have to update your, your representation and your understanding of the brain in real time because you, while you were sleeping, your brain was not fully updating it uh, about the world outside. It was doing only a partial update using a limited amount of information. So at this point you have to, because you fell down and, and you, know, you have to catch up with what's happening, you have to really do a very quick job of, of trying to understand and, and, and take rapid action if you need to. So these are, are simple ways of, of looking at what the brain typically does. Now, another part of this is if you look at the brain as a multimodal system, which has more than one sensors, and most uh, mammals do and, and complex organisms do, but the simpler organisms don't. Insects usually, they, they also have multiple sensor, sensory systems, but they don't have as many as, as mammals do. So it's, it's a simpler problem for them. And again, the, the similar thing here, we're going to go a little more detail, but basically the data information gathering that you're doing, um, what your brain already knows because you've lived in this world is that a lot of data information fit together. So for example, if you are using your eyes and your eyes give you in information in terms of color and you're getting information about multiple colors in, in the scene in front of you and there's a color of a patch over here and a different color patch over here, um, your mind, your brain and mind will, because of the history of, of you living in this environment, will learn to match the fact that these two colors in this type of proximity um, in this environment probably refers to something that's the same object. For example, you may be looking at a tree which has dark green leaves and it has brown or tan colored um, or, or even birch colored, you know, a whitish colored um, tree trunk. And so you see these two colors and your mind will associate these two colors with the same object. Um, and so you have a better understanding of the physical world that this is a tree. And the reason why you know this is a tree is because you see the multiple colors, you see the proximity and the association with them. And you can fit together this data to see that this is one tree. Now, at this point, you're fitting together data from only one sense, right? Only from your eyes. But at the same time, you're also going to be um, getting other types of information. So from your visual sense, senses, you have color. You may see the shapes of these objects. You may see shadows if it's sun, you know, sunny and, and lit outside. And you may realize that this is a tree. And then you have a, a mental representation of there's a tree over there. Um, and at the same time, your tactile sensor, your skin, may be sensing a slight breeze. And it may be sensing the breeze in a very cool, you know, less humid environment. So your tactile skin uh, um, receptors will, will pick up on these. 
Um, it may even sense the direction of the wind, um, depending on how sophisticated a ring you have and, and your, your sensory apparatus uh, is. Um, you may even see that the tree is swaying, the leaves are rustling, so there's movement. So that may give you, an, uh, you know, a representation of, 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 of the world. You may um, see with your eyes and you may smell um, another animal nearby. And if you're, if you're a predator type animal, humans are, um, you may sense that that's a gazelle, that it might be meat for you, you know, potential meat. Um, you may also smell a lion, in which case you realize that that's also a predator. And you being a predator, being a predator, you have to assess which is the greater threat. Are you a threat to it or is it a threat to you? So you, you know, your, your brain, brain at, a, at a low level will instantly recognize these things. Um, it may feel um, heat and thirst and um, realize that it's sunny and hot outside. So all of these things put together give you a symbolic, multiple representations of, in a symbolic sense of the world around you, the immediate world around you. And then these things put together um, at a higher level and, and deeper into the brain and into, as this, all of this information is shared within multiple networks within the brain, it gives you a much more sophisticated understanding of the, that the world that you're in. Um, you start to realize that the tree is a possible place for shelter. And, and part of that comes from your memory because you've learned this, but also because of the shape of the tree and, and the specific tree you're looking at, you may recognize that, yes, it's possible for me to climb, it's possible for me to use it as shelter. You may see in this specific case that this tree also has some fruits or, or you know berries or something on it. So it, it could be a source of food for you. Um, you saw the gazelle, you smelled the gazelle, so you may realize that that's food. But parts of your body, you know, again, you're collecting data also from your body, so you may realize that your body is tired, you know, and, and again, this is close to nighttime, so you, you haven't gotten a rest. So you may have this understanding that while you're tired and there's food nearby, you can't really chase it because you have to chase it to catch it. You can't chase it. So it's while it's food, it's not really accessible. And, and again, the, the level of sophistication of this understanding may not be the way that we're explaining it. Maybe just this inkling of an idea that food and no, you know, it might be something like that, that food, but it's an accessible in, inaccessible food, right? It might, it might not be as elaborate, elaborately uh, delineated as we have on the screen here. Uh, most uh, mammals wouldn't do that. They would basically have a concept of food and whether it's accessible or not, or whether it's easy to get or not. It might be as simple as that. Um, if, it's, if, if it's a food that is very easy to get, um, then your notion is food, and, and, and then that may suggest the planning actions you need to take, because if it's very accessible and very close to you, that you may need to take quick action before it runs away from you. Um, again, with the lion, you may have a sense that you have to hide. And again, because you're tired, you can't run, so you have to find another way of hiding. You can't, you can't escape it. You need to hide in a different way. The breeze may um, indicate to you, and again, you live in this environment, you know what, what that odors travel through the breeze. You, your brain has learned this. So you may realize that you have to, uh, to hide downwind from the animal so that the animal can't smell you. And your brain already already knows, your brain has sensed from your skin the direction of travel of the breeze. So you know the direction it's moving in. You also know the direction that the line is in because the wind carried that to you. So you have to uh, figure out which what's the direction of downwind that you can hide in so that the line won't uh, detect you, etc. So, so using all of this information and your understanding of it, you can come up with a simple plan of action that there's a tree, you can climb the tree to hide, and then after you climb the tree, you have to be still and stationary, not to make too much noise or, or action to, try to attract attention to yourself. And that may be the action that you end up taking because that's the situation you're in, in 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 this world. So using multiple parts of your your sensory apparatus to to come up with an understanding, and then to uh, to to plan something, what you should do, set a goal for yourself. You know the goal is to escape or the goal is to hide, and then to actually take action. Then you climb the tree, and then you you are are still. You know you you don't move. Um, you try not to move in that tree. So these are all um, activities that that the brain does. Now, now we're going to um, talk about something called aphantasia, which is, which is um, an aspect of our sensory apparat apparatus that we, uh, we are born with. Um, and this basically affects the internal, so the simple de definition, I'm, I'm going to give you a much more complicated nuanced definition, but the simple definition of somebody who has a, 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 a aphantasia is that they, they have difficulty imagining things or they have difficulty forming visual images inside their mind. Um, so many of us, or most of us, um, if, if I tell you to imagine your house, or imagine the front of your house, 
you'll be able to imagine that fairly easily. I mean, you'll be able to imagine the front door, you'll be able to imagine maybe a sidewalk, maybe some plants nearby, um, windows, etc. You may imagine the color of your door and all of these things will be, if you close your eyes, all of these things will be sort of like an image in your brain. Um, and people with aphantasia have difficulty forming an image or in some cases they can't form any image. If you ask them to, to do that, um, and, and, and many times they, they don't know that this is a deficiency of their brain or that it's, it's, a, it's an ability that they, don't, they are not able to do because they don't know that other people can do it. It's almost like a deaf person doesn't know that other people can hear because they can't hear. And if they can't hear, they don't assume that somebody else has an ability that they, that they, you know, they, they don't have. Like we can't, we don't have, don't have the ability to see ultraviolet light. So we don't automatically assume that other humans do have the ability to see ultraviolet light. I mean, we don't have this ability. We have no knowledge that there's an, even this ability to see ultraviolet light. Similarly, people who have aphantasia, they don't imagine that there's even an ability to imagine vision, visual things in the mind because they can't do it. So they, 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 their mind uh, understands everyone else's mind to be similar to theirs, that if they can't do it, then more than likely everyone else's can't until you know, after they've grown up and they've learned some things, then they may come to a realization that other people have this ability that I don't have. Um, and then they learn about it and, and, and you know, then they realize um, this is the situation. Now, this, this um, condition actually was detected. Um, it was actually detected in, in the early 1800s initially and documented, but it, there wasn't much done about it because there, at that time um, there was not much that could have been understood it was a very, very rudimentary understanding that we had that, that a person, that a doctor had uh, assessed, um, relayed that they couldn't imagine things. Actually, it was, it was, it was, a, speak, it was a talk in, in a gathering, and I believe it or not, Charles Darwin was one of the people there, and one person said they're not able to, and Charles Darwin said that they, they, they have uh, a very vivid uh, ability to imagine things. Um, so anyway, so the people there recognized there's this difference, but beyond that, nothing was done. And then in, in, I think it was 2005, so not that long ago, um, there was this, um, uh, again, a, a patient who had, a, uh, they had surgery and, and after the surgery, they lost their ability to, to imagine uh, uh, visual things because they had it prior to that. And all of a sudden after the surgery, they lost this ability. So they realized that they lost this ability and they told the doctor and the doctor realized and, and, and then this became something that was understood, but again, it wasn't realized that this could happen naturally. This was this was thought to have been an outcome of the surgery that it caused some type of damage maybe in the person's brain, and you know just as a stroke causes damage in people's brain, this wasn't understood exactly what it meant or why it happened, other than that it was probably an outcome of the surgery that this person uh, underwent. Um, and then um, actually in 2015, 10 years later, um, another uh, uh, physician. Um, learned about another patient um, who told them, and then they started finding out from many other people. They, they, they give a talk about this and, and they gave their email information. And other pe many people started sending them information saying, oh, I also can't do this. And then this doctor started realizing this, is, this, is, this may be actually common to some extent. And they're the, they're, that's the person who for, formed this name for it, which we today we call aphantasia. And the initial um, in, indication of it was that um, the person could not form visual uh, representations of images in the brain. But now we understand it doesn't have only to do with visual stimuli. It can actually refer to other types of information, uh, sensory information. So the more modern version of it is, even though the name is aphantasia, and aphantasia originally, and, and most of the time when people refer to it, it, it usually has the, the connotation of visual. It can be used in a different, rep in a different sense. But usually, just for clarity's sake, when pe people are referring to a different sensory uh, type of aphantasia, they put an adjective in front of it. For example, olfactory aphantasia, which refers to a uh, sense, um, sense of smell. Or it may be um, um, a, a tactile or auditory aphantasia, which refers to difficulty hearing, um, you know, um, imagining sounds or imagining music. Um, those are all types of, of aphantasia that exist in the world. So the, the basic concept is that um, aphantasia exists on a continuum. So, so a person can have completely no loss of ability, or they can have um, partial loss or gradual loss or complete loss. But then also there's the other side of the continuum where the typical person who has a normal ability to imagine and, and visualize things, 
there are also people who, on this continuum who are, have better ability. So, and then you go in the positive direction, in the hyper positive direction. And there's, there's a term called hyper uh, hyper aphantasia, not aphantasia, but hyper fantasia, in which those people have a much more heightened and increased sensory uh, uh, vividness. So when they imagine things, they imagine it in a much more uh, elaborate way. So if you imagine an apple, or, or you, any, any of us, one of us imagines an apple, we might see something that looks like an apple shape. It might be somewhat reddish colored. We might see some aspects of it. But a person with hyperfantasia may imagine a really bright red apple. They may even have a se sense of smell of that apple. Their, their sensory apparatus may, may be very, very highly stimulated, even though there's no real apple in front of them. Inside their mind, they're having this very vivid, extremely vivid uh, sensations of this apple. Whereas a, a neurotypical person would only see the apple, they probably won't even smell it because they're only trying to imagine it in one sense. And if they're told to smell it, they will only smell it, they won't, they won't see it at the same time. It'll only be one, one uh, sensory system that'll be activated. But in a hyper uh, uh, fantasia, uh, fantasic person, m multiple of these uh, sensor, senses may be activated at the same time. So it could be difficulty or um, exceptional ability in imagining a sensory input. Again, this is imagined. Um, the, the key point is that there is nothing physical in the world that they're observing. There's no sound or smell or visual stimuli that they're actually looking at or, or sensing. Um, so, um, and again, it is on a continuum. Now, when we're talking about uh, um, aphantasia, usually we're talking about visual. So the concept of dreaming is, is, a, is a version of visual imagination. So aphantasia people, uh, actually, many of them can dream. They they, they do dream, um, but uh, I have another slide that goes a little more into it. But there's some deficits in the dreaming. And again, when we're dreaming, uh, some people actually can, can dream and, and smell things, um, or they can actually feel things in that dream. So again, this is an aspect of, of, of our sensory apparatus, where in dreaming, they can actually sense just, this is normal for most people. You, you, don't, you don't have these sensations in every dream, but every once in a while, you might have a dream we actually feel something where, where somebody's touching your arm and you actually feel their touch is in your dream. And obviously it's not a real touch, but in your mind, it's an imagined uh, virtual sensation of, of a touch, um, which can occur in a dream. Um, uh, now, this is not a disorder, but it is uh, something that's called a neurodivergence. It's, it's along the spectrum of, of um, divergences in our uh, uh, neurological system, in our brain systems. Um, so it's definitely not a disorder. And it can accept any sensory system. It can accept only one system, uh, multiple, you know, two or three or more systems, or it can affect every system that a person has. Um, uh, so that there's a lot of um, a lot of uh, variability in this. And again, it can be associated with um, other. So a person who has a fantasia can have other deficit neuro, uh, neuro, neuro, uh, neurological deficits, and in some cases they actually have advantages. Um, so, um, for example, this is also associated with um, um, uh, autism, and sometimes their IQ can be higher, um, or they, they may have increased ability in artistic ability, things like that. So, so um, believe it or not, even though um, it's a deficit, it's not, not, a, not a problem, but it's a diminished ability to imagine visual stimuli, let's say, still they may be able to do more artistic work because um, a lot of times when, what happens in neurotypical people, when there is a deficit in one area, it actually creates an, an advantage in a comparable area. Um, and that's what seems to happen here also, though not, not all the time. It's, it's, it's very, very um, uh, unusual in that uh, the patterns are, are very complicated. One, person, one person's um, set of, of advantages and disadvantages. Um, may be very unusual and to a different person. They may have a completely different set of, uh, set of uh, uh, differences in the brain, in, in the sensory systems of their brain. Um, so, um, yeah, so uh, this can affect um, any and all of the sensory systems in the brain. And these are just some, these are not all of them, but it can affect the five that we're aware of. It can also affect things like pain, which is nociception. Proprioception is your body's position, you know, for example, when you're dancing or moving. Your body knows its uh, the positions of your limbs. Um, for example, you know when an animal is in a tree, this is one of the reasons how it knows if it's upside down and if it's hanging or not upside down. Uh, the motor system, the stimulation of the motor system, your balance system, even emotional replay. I mean, there, there are many, many uh, sensory systems that we have 
and one or all of these can be affected by this. Um, um, we talked about dreams. Uh, so dreams, it, it, it can, uh, most of the time when people have aphantasia, they um, have imagery less often in dreams or that they dream less often. The, uh, their dreams are less vivid than a neurotypical person. Um, they, uh, sometimes they have no visual imagery, but they do have a knowledge and awareness after they, they're awake and even uh, when they're dreaming that there are sensory elements of the dream. That, for example, when they're dreaming, they have a, a sense that they're dreaming with images. But when they wake up, they can't, they can't imagine the images. They can't uh, conjure up the images that they actually saw when, during the dream. So during the dreaming, they saw these images, and it was similar to a, um, a neurotypical person's uh, dream. You know, when we see images and we remember it. Um, but they won't remember the images, but they'll have a sense of what the things were the dream about, they, they may be able to verbalize it, describe it using words or describing using other methods, or even describing using moving their own body, you know, in, in terms of kinesthetics. So if they saw that somebody was doing something in the dream, they were walking down the street, they may be able to visual, ver verbalize it by saying that I'm walking, but they can't in their mind see uh, the person walking down, but they can actually animate and, and walk themselves to, to show the exact manner, if it was an unusual type of, of walking in the dream, let's say the person was walking backward, they can actually uh, recreate the dream by the, themselves physically walking backward to show that they understood exactly what was happening in the dream, even though visually in their mind they can't imagine an image of a person walking backwards. Um, so visually they can't recreate it when they're awake, but when they were dreaming, they did have the visual representation but they have an understanding of it after they've, they've awakened. So this is very unusual in, in the sense that there are indications where the visual uh, the sensory apparatus is working, um, uh, especially when they're dreaming um, or even in other cases. I mean, this has not been studied well enough to understand what there may be other scenarios where it does work um, other than just dreams. But these are things that, that we know we know happen. Um, so let me let me pause here and, and just um, do a quick um, uh, rundown on where we are to make sure that, that we have an understanding of this. So basically what what um, uh, multimodality is and um, how this may, uh, you know, we're going to go a little further into, into this, uh, especially with um, AI, but um, I want to make sure that everyone has a good understanding of this so far. So if anyone has any questions or, or has any comments, your own experiences, if you know someone who has a, con a related condition. And actually, this actually goes into, it's, it's very, very complicated because you, we, we've talked about um, um, there's a condition where people have, are face blind. So the, the percentage of people who have aphantasia, the percentage of them who have face blindness is also higher. Um, there's also a condition where you cannot imagine um, stories or, or you know, word, repetitions of words and, and sentences. You have difficulty imagining those, even though you could say them and you can hear them. But if you wanted to imagine a sentence and, and you know, if you if you um, want to write a story, you may have difficulty imagining it. But you may be able to physically write it using pen and paper or type using a keyboard. But imagining a sentence inside your brain alone may be difficult. So it's unusual. So in that sense, these are all, uh, to some extent, they're related, but um, there are uh, disparate um, elements that um, make them unique for, for every person. So um, if anyone um, has any question or wants to give a comment. So folks, um, go ahead, uh, type exclamation point in the chat and or raise your hand in Zoom uh, to uh, ask a question to Sanjay as to what we covered thus far. Um, how does aphantasia or uh, uh, actually impact us on a day like impact an individual on a daily basis like what can it they do like is it it's not from my understanding uh not a uh disability per se you do have some advantages with it per, so that there are some things that you're able to do better just as not totally dissimilar to say that somebody with autism or anything uh, any other disability, there's some there's some advantages and disadvantages to it. Right. So yeah. So so there are some disadvantages. There are also advantages. But people who have the condition, especially if they were born with it, they didn't realize it. Um, they function just as well as anyone else. They really don't have 
too many um, deficits that are obvious to them. They, their brain basically learns just as a, as a blind person or a deaf person will learn to operate in the world. And they may not even realize that they have this deficit until they grow older and they're told about it. Um, and so they, they learn to function and manage very well. What does happen though is that because of the type of um, condition that they have, it may change how their brain operates in some very narrow areas. For example, when they're in school and every child goes through school. So when they're in school, um, it may affect their ability to, um, for example, for math problems. If, if the teacher, if you're in a geometry class, geometry requires you to imagine shapes. And so that student may not understand why they have difficulty in geometry. They may not, because they don't understand that other students can imagine the shape in geometry. They see it on, a, on, a, on, a, on, the, on the board that the teacher draws, but they don't realize that other students also can imagine that same shape inside their mind when the teacher erases the board. So for this student, when, when the board is erased, that shape disappears and they can't imagine it anymore. So for them to become good at geometry, they may have to create other representations in their mind, more sophisticated representations that help them remember, for example, a triangle. So even though we can all, you know, I, I believe most of us can, can imagine the shape of a triangle inside our mind, and there are many, many forms of tri triangles. There are equilateral triangles, and acute triangles, many shapes and sizes of triangles that you can imagine. Um, and actually, when I said the word imagine, triangle, in my mind, not only did I, did I imagine a triangle, but I also imagined the triangle being a specific color, okay, which auto almost automatically happened because our visual system is very color focused. So that may happen to many, many of you also. So our, our, our um, you know, so a person with neurotypical, uh, so with, with, with aphantasia, um, may learn to compensate without realizing they're compensating because they don't realize they have a deficit. And, you know, when they're in school and the teacher erases the, the board and the teacher says, now imagine this triangle, um, you know, uh, rotated. Okay. And they can't imagine it rotated. They don't know what, what, you know, when the teacher is saying, imagine it rotated, they don't realize that the other students in the class are actually imagining inside their mind is rotating. What the student learns is that the way you imagine a triangle rotating in your mind is you imagine three ver three vertexes, not, not in terms of three points in space, but you imagine an XY coordinate, you imagine another XY coordinate, you imagine another XY coordinate. So they represent a triangle in terms of three XY, you know, if it's a two-dimensional plane. They might imagine uh, a triangle as XY coordinate one, XY coordinate two, XY coordinate three, and then they would rotate it, meaning they would change each of these three points in space in a certain way. Now, if they are able to do it fairly well, this may be where, where it causes them to become more mathematically gifted. And in a sense, their IQ might rise because they have learned, you know, because of their motivation to learn geometry, they managed to figure out ways of representing that triangle in ways that you and I can't. It's very difficult for us to representation a triangle using three points of XY coordinates and do a, 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 a fine transformation. Now on a computer you can. And if you're if you're more advanced in geometry, if you're more advanced in mathematics, for example, you could take a, a right triangle and if you rotate it, it's fairly easy to rotate the points because the right triangle rotates more, more smooth, especially if you're rotating exactly 90 degrees. It's more easier for some of us to do it in our minds. But for this student who is uh, can't imagine the, the shape, they managed to figure out ways to do it. And, and in a sense, they become gifted in this narrow way because they have this deficit that they're not, they don't really realize. And, and they want to, to learn this topic. Now, another student who wants to learn geometry, no matter how hard they try, they're not able to, and they end up failing geometry. So it may be a deficit, but what might happen is that because they, they fail geometry, they may have a heightened interest in, in maybe other subjects because their mind now doesn't spend time learning geometry because they're doing poorly in it. Their mind is free, so while they're sitting in geometry class, they may th be thinking about another class, maybe a writing class, and their mind is basically doing a lot of additional processing in geometry class in this other subject, and they actually, their mind is spending extra time writing and imagining, and they end up becoming a better writer, but a worst mathematician. So yeah, it's, it's very difficult to predict and say what will happen to a particular person, but there are um, advantages that people get, and, and sometimes there, there are disadvantages that they get. Yeah, thank you for that. That's a that's a great answer. Actually, I'm going to put something in the chat. It's that you know that it does force you to think differently from everyone else, so that you're coming up with ways that uh, you know that other people haven't thought of. Um, you know, I put I'll put an article in, uh, in the chat from many years ago from the Economist called uh, "In Praise of Misfits," 
uh, and it's actually just an interesting way of uh, uh, looking at uh, people that have um, different ways of looking at the world uh, and analyzing yeah. problems. Um, but That's actually that a great article up. I read that years ago, yeah. So um, with that, uh, we have Vanessa followed by DLJ, then Bob. Okay, I was mm -hmm. wondering, because you mentioned some may be skilled artistically, could um, someone, let's say, their childhood, uh, a place they spend a lot of time, let's say 20 years down the road, if they're good at sketching, could they possibly, you know, draw the image from something they've also seen? And also, um, in my case, it's kind of related where maybe you can't say, imagine whatever it is, a piece of pizza. But someone says, you know, close your eyes, you're at the beach, you know, summer vacation. Might they be able to form an image that's, you know, a memory in the mind they experienced and saw versus simply, okay, imagine you're at the seashore and, you know, go tell me a story. So can they be maybe guided to create an image, you know, if they have a, they uh, maybe took it in and like could describe it, you know, in detail. But like I said, if they were just to say, okay, imagine the theme may be a different story. So can some have that um, ability? So yeah, again, this is this is such a, a, a vast range of, of uh, behaviors that a person can have. So you may have somebody who has a very um, a weak sense, but a very, very, you know, they, they may be able to in very rare cases, or they may be able to develop to some extent. But typically, if, if it's if it's a a deficiency, they won't be able to overcome it completely or, or even sufficient, you know, strongly. Um, there may be areas where they they have they you know, and again, when we talk about deficiency, you have to remember that deficiency is is not simply uh, biological, but also has to do with our um, training of the brain. So, for example, if the student that we, the example I gave who who is sitting in geometry class, if that student early on gives up with geometry, it may be that they actually can. Um, imagine very simply, they may be able to imagine extremely simple shapes. So for example, a line they may be able to orient in, in their brain. Okay, A single line they may be able to orient and imagine, um, but a complicated shape like a, like a um, let's say a hexagon, Okay, um, they can't imagine. That's too complicated. Or a three-dimensional shape they can't imagine, but a one-dimensional or two-dimensional shape they can imagine. So it may be that the limitation they have is, is, is partial, but because they don't push themselves at all, they never realize that they have a partial limitation and they always consider it a full limitation. And then as they grow older and they're challenged in some situations, they may realize, oh, I'm actually able to develop my sense of kind of, you know, I, I've gained it. They may not realize that they haven't gained it. It's just that they they always assumed they had zero ability when they actually had a partial ability and they never developed a partial ability. So I don't, I mean, it's not understood well enough and I definitely don't understand this well enough to say whether it can be improved upon from the way it's understood right now, it doesn't seem to be that it can be improved by the person themselves because it's it's really the, the brain, the way it's, and again, the, another part of this is that we don't know if it's congenital or if it's um, uh, during um, uh, the maturation in utero or if it's in the early years of life when the brain is really, really growing and evolving and, and pruning. We're not sure where along the process um, this uh, really happens in a, a typical person, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in any individual person. Um, so we don't know if it might happen, uh, you know, in, in let's say the first few years of life. And so it, it can be overcome by a different type of educational system. We don't know anything about that. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I mean, it. it's probably likely that people don't recognize the full extent of ability that they have and they kind of assume that they don't have any ability and then later on in life they might realize they have some ability of it um, so whether that is is um, learning that ability or adding that ability it probably isn't but it might be we don't know thanks for that sanjay uh next up we have uh dlj followed by bob hi there can you hear me okay absolutely hi, all right. Um, yeah, sorry, I'm late. Um, I tune in. I found out you're talking about me. So if you've got any questions for somebody who has who is a fantasiac, um, I'm here for you. What do you want to know? <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. Only this year, though, I realized because all this all this all this time, um, all this time, even up till uh, earlier this year, I thought people were kidding. Seriously, didn't realize when people said they had a mind's eye. I thought it was a metaphor. 
And now I realize that you guys are weird, right? You've got this mind image thing. What is that? You can see things in your mind. You're strange, man. <laughs> yeah, the geometry, really, yeah. the geometry thing is interesting because um, I hadn't thought about that before. So like I said, I've only known about this. I just assumed that everybody was the same. Um, yeah, I did maths A-level, uh, further maths A-level as well. Algebra, piece of cake. And by the way, you, there's something called a pencil, pen and pencil. So when you're doing geometry, you write it, you draw it. You don't have to see it in your mind. and You'll be able to do the math side of things, right? Mm -hmm. I, can't, I can't see a triangle. I, yeah, I, I know what a triangle is, though. You know, I've seen a hexagon before, right? So I, <laughs> I, I don't have to imagine it in my head because I can I go, all right, hexagon, I know what that looks like. You know, it's got equals, <laughs> equal, equal angles. Or, yeah, all right. Anyway, so any questions? Sorry, I missed the beginning. So I only saw the last three slides. So, um, but yeah, what, you, what I did see... Um, I suddenly went, ooh, yeah. Oh, by the way, not genetic, because the first thing I, I did was ask my sister. I said, have you heard about this thing? She said, no. I went, okay, well, I've just only just found out. Um, I, so I said the same thing that somebody said to me when I realised. So I said, um, they, they said to me, imagine a car. And I went, uh. <laughs> and then and they said, what colour is it? I went, what do you mean? <laughs> right. And they went, ah, you're a fantasia, because that's how they found out about themselves, right? Uh, and anyway, I said, did that to her, and she goes, "Yeah, of course, I can imagine fifteen different shapes and sizes of cars and different colours." And I go, "Ah, you're kidding, right?" <laughs> so she's what's called actually hyperphantasiac, which she says is hyperfantastic, just to rub it in. So there's the opposite end of the spectrum. I don't know if you covered this hyperphantasiac, which is when you can see, you know, like think of an apple, they think of a whole orchard all the way through the seasons within a split second. I have no idea what that's like. It's very strange. Anyway, yeah, we, we did we did we did go into hyperphantasia, so um, that was what was mentioned. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's a continuum along, and and the neurotypical people are you could say in in the middle of that continuum. Um, people who tend to have no ability in a specific uh, sensory system might be on one extreme, and then people who are hyperphantasic are along along the continuum on the other side. Um, there's no way to know exactly what the maximum of hyperphantasia might be. I mean, it may actually be synesthesia where you know, that your sensory systems start to blend together. That may be where the extreme mm -hmm. of hyperphantasia melds into. We're not sure. Um, there's no way to know at this point. But um, yeah, those, those yeah. people are weird, obviously, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm the well, yeah. they're, they're on, on um, um, you know, LSD, maybe. <laughs> some some uh, psychotropic drugs. But yeah, it's it's that's fantastic to, to know that you uh, you have this uh, and, and you can help us to understand it better. That's great. Yeah, yeah it's, it's not a problem. It's 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 a it's a normal part of the world. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Dale J. Look forward to actually hearing more about it. Uh, Bob, um, I may I may have missed something, but uh, are we talking about uh, adults who are um, are missing something? They they don't have the wiring, or uh, can we can we think of a um, a uh, child, perhaps, who has, who is, uh, who seems to, who, who when tested seems to have, uh, lacks artistic ability, but when they, but they can learn uh, when they, when they uh, proceed to become an adult, they can learn artistic uh, ability. Um, can, can we misjudge uh, what is uh, sensory missing things, or uh, can can they be learned? Uh, okay, okay. Can they be uncovered? Perhaps say it that way. Okay. So, so I mean, you're you're asking really two questions. One, one it has to do with how it's diagnosed or how it's detected in a in, in a specific individual. And obviously, during that process, there can be mistakes made. Um, so that's one aspect of what you're asking: is can there be mistakes made? There can be, but that doesn't mean that the condition doesn't exist. Um, the condition is known to exist. There have been many, many. Um, uh, well done studies um, across, uh, um, they're not huge samples, but, but you know, hundreds of people. Um, and we, in fact, you know, DOJ said that he, uh, he uh, believes and, and he understands himself to have this condition also. So it's not simply that they don't have artistic ability. So when we're talking about the visual side of aphantasia, it's not that they don't have artistic ability. Okay? An aphantasic, aphantasic person probably does have visual ability. And in some cases, they have heightened visual ability. They, they actually are better artists than uh, a neurotypical person in some cases. I mean, in other cases, they're a worse artist. So again, the, the, where, where, they, 
where they, uh, this, this uh, uh, condition puts them on, on a particular skill um, spectrum, um, it's difficult to say. And, and some of it, again, may be because of the education or training and, and schooling that they receive. Maybe that they, they are uh, aphantasic, but um, their teacher, their artistic, their art teacher in school discouraged them because they weren't able to imagine. And that discouragement not only affected their, um, it, it affected, end up, ended up affecting their ability to, to draw and, and their willingness to draw. So it might be that, that they, they would be uh, at least normal, if not even better than other students at drawing and painting and, and sculpting and other forms of visual arts. But it may be that the schooling, um, just similar to what happens with dyslexic students, right? Dyslexic students, we've seen for many, many years that they were misunderstood and oftentimes because they were dyslexic, um, they were either put in special programs which didn't challenge them enough, therefore their mind was not developed enough. But then later on in life, they were tested and they were found to have extremely high IQ. And then they were put in a different program and then their brain, they developed um, and, and caught up to other students th at their peer level. So this is really where the diagnostic side is, is one, where it can be done incorrectly, although probably that's not uh, you know, occurring too much today. Um, there are sophisticated ways of detecting this. Actually, the detecting in, in MRI scanners is, um, is pretty sophisticated because when, when, uh, so, so in, when we're talking about the visual uh, version of aphantasia, there are particular two regions of the brain, the occipital region, which is the visual cortex, the, the rear part of the brain, and the, the, um, the uh, uh, um, parietal region, which is the top um, uh, rear region of the brain, which is kind of related to spatial and world activity. So those two areas, one or both, are where they see diminished activity in a person with, with visual aphantasia. And again, the aphantasia can be any sensory system. It can be multiple sensory systems. But MRI scans definitely show diminished activity in those regions of the brain. It's not that they have diminished artistic ability, um, because artistic ability is in a completely different area of the brain. It's not necessarily, it's not necessary to visualize something to, to be able to draw something. You can visualize, like for example, like you can write write a story without needing to visualize the scene in front of you, right? You can imagine a story without having a visual repetition of it, just as you can write a story without having a an auditory uh, sense of the story, right? Or without having a smell, you know, olfactory sense of a story, right? We we realize that you don't need to smell a story to write a story. You don't need to hear a story to write a story. Same way you don't need to see a story to write a story. That's something a lot of us don't realize. But the way our brain is structured, you, you can do one activity without needing another activity. And that's the part that I want everyone to understand here is that the way our brain naturally exists and, and uh, evolved is that a deficit in any one, any one area does not prohibit or prevent you from functioning normally in pretty much any other area. Your brain probably will count, compensate for a diminished, uh, and it does, I mean, and, and the fact is that what we're learning now is pretty much every human being on the planet has deficits in one or more parts of their body, not just the brain, one or more parts of our bodies. So some people are born with, let's say, um, 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 you know, a cardiac uh, a limitation. Other people may have asthma. Other people may have some other genetic, or, or even if it's not genetic, even if, if it's acquired, it may, they may have some type of deficit in their physical body. Same way people have deficits in their, in their mental capacity or mental abilities, mental skills. And just as, as, a, as, a, as a person who's diabetic, um, they learn to compensate that. A person with, with uh, aphantasia will learn to compensate that and, and live a normal life. So um, again, this is a, the, the divergence of, of our physical being. Um, it really doesn't seem to affect us too much unless, unless you happen to be in a profession which requires that specific ability um, and then you probably won't be successful in that profession. You might end up changing profession then because of that. Um, just as you know, if you're if you have a cardiac disorder, right, and you start off going into a, a high um, um, uh, caliber sports activity, well, your cardiac limitation is going to limit how much of a sports a top athlete you'll become. And so you probably won't be a top athlete. You'll have to not be a professional athlete. You'll have to go into a different profession. So just like that can happen with a, with our body, that a, a limitation of our body can can affect our profession. Same thing with with the mind. Uh, may I give a strange example uh, from myself? Uh, th there are people I've known for uh, 10, 15 years, and I and somebody asked me, 
do they wear glasses or do they have a beard? And for the life of me, I can't remember whether they wear glasses or, uh, or whether they ha had a beard. And um, when I meet them the second time, then, then I can check, the, then I can uh, know if I notice that, then I can remember. <laughs> but, it, but until I notice it, I, don't, I can't, I have no visualization. Very right. strange. So, so that's, that's a totally different concept. So in, in that situation, what's happening is that the, uh, you're, you're able to form a mental image because when you see a person, a person's face, okay, um, you have a memory of that person's face and that memory is stored in your mind. Okay. And then later on, maybe hours later or days later, you're asked to tell me, did that person wear glasses? So you, from your memory, you recall the face and then you have a visual representation of the face. You imagine the face in your, inside your mind. Okay. But the memory, the re recollection that you bring up is partial. Okay. Now it may be that the storage of that memory was partial or it may be that storage is complete, but your recollection is partial. Okay. It could be either of the two. It may be that when you recall the face, that you recall it without the glasses, or maybe that you stored it without the glasses. It could be either of the two. I mean, there, there are different um, modalities to our to our uh, memories also. So, for example, the the um, the details with which we store memories. Okay. For example, when you see a person, whether you store how much detail you store, you, your mind stores about their face, and not just their face, about everything about that person, right? Um, some people might store the exact location where you met the person, right? And the, and the day of year and, and the date, you know, in, on the calendar that you, that you uh, met that person, right? And you remember their hair, whether they had glasses, you might remember the clothes that they wore, right? So all of these are details associated with that person and that memory is a more complicated memory, which includes all of that. And it's there in your mind. Another person might remember only some of that when they record the memory. I'm talking about the storing of the memory, right? And then, Days later, when you're asked to, to, you know, someone someone asks you about the person, oh, I, I heard you met this person, you know, uh, you know, tell me, is it the right, is it the same person? Did were they wearing glasses? And you're trying to remember, huh? Were they wearing glasses? Okay. Well, at that point, if your memory already stored that information, then it's a greater chance that you will be able to recall it because it's already stored. But if it wasn't stored, if the information about glasses wasn't even stored, there's no way you'll be able to recall it. So there's multiple aspects to this, which is totally unrelated to aphantasia. This is more about our sensory, our sensory system, how accurately we sense things, how accurately we see and observe, and how accurately we re record them. And then there's another aspect of this, which is much more complicated. We're not, we're not going to go into it tonight, but the nature of our memory is actually fragile and, and delicate, and it can be changed. So the act of recalling, so for example, if the person asks you a question, were they wearing glasses? Sometimes in some people, the fact that they're asking you where they were in glasses might allow you. And some people, what happens is they actually in, in, implant the image of glasses on the person's face, even though the person was never wearing glasses when you saw them. The memory that you recorded of them doesn't have any glasses, but you, when you're trying to recall it, because there was a suggestion made that they were wearing glasses, and if you're that type of person who is highly suggestible, the recall that you have of the person may include glasses, even though the person never did in your memory doesn't have it. The recall may include glasses. And then when you have this image of a person with, with, with glasses, you may end up storing it again. And the restoring of that memory will have glasses now, which is a false memory. That's kind of how false memories occur. So this is one of the reasons why our memory system, for example, in court cases are not always reliable because they can be um, false. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, so why don't we uh, move on? Uh, thank you, Bob, for the question. and. Uh... Why don't we get on with the second half of the presentation so we can go to the Q&A from there. Yeah, I, I saw that there was, there was something, there was somebody who asked, I think um, Katie asked about um, how does this fit into gravity and, and as far as uh, theory, how does it fit into theory and for gravity. And DOJ answered um, for him. So DOJ, I'm not sure, do you have aphantasia in other senses other than visual or is it only visual? That's it. I don't know. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, that's, that's I'll fine. ask some specific questions and I'll be able to, I don't know, because this is quite new to me. I've just assumed that everybody was the same, right? So it's, it's, it's a sudden, it's a weird thing that it's only recent. And so if somebody asks me a question, then I go, oh yeah, that happens and that doesn't happen. So we, you mentioned dreams, right? So I, you know, those moments when you dream, um, but I can't, I can't visualize it up when I'm awake now, but I think as I'm sort of waking up, there's something happening. Um, mm -hmm. 
you know, being naked in public or your usual stuff. Right? Um, so, uh, and yeah, so I can answer direct questions um, if you trigger me, but um, yeah. So, so, yeah. So here, I can well, let's uh, move on and just so, so we can stay on time, but we will come back to this. How's that? Is that okay? okay? Yeah. So, so just I, I just want to want to have an exa example from what Katie asked about. So she asked about gravity specifically. So I'll give the example where if someone asked you to imagine yourself floating on, in, a, in a pool, right? So that's an example where aphantasia can can affect a person's um, balance system and their proprietary proprioceptory system. And that is possible. That can be affected. So if a person is asked to imagine them, so they're not, they're sitting in a chair, they're standing, they're walking, they do something, not they're floating at all, but they're asked to imagine as if you're floating. Now, most people would be able to do that. But if, if you, whoever you are, if you're not able to imagine that, or if you have a little bit of difficulty, then you may be in terms of gravity or in terms of those senses, right? The senses of balance and body position. You may have a little bit of, or, or even, uh, you know, strong aphantasia in that sense. So yeah, it can happen to any any sensory system. Um, so anyway, so um, I think that's that's all. So let's go back to the slide. So I um, let me try to. Oh well, yeah, sorry, I have to start the slide. How much time do you think the second half just so more? Not not too long. I mean, we we will have enough time for. Um, so I, I'm I'm trying to keep these shorter because there's a, um, and and actually what I wanted to do was I wanted to have a lot more um, okay. visual elements to this, but it was very difficult to create uh, this time. So I I kept this a little more on the, uh, the brief side. I think I'm not. Let me cancel. I'm not able to see my screen. I need to. Okay, there it is. All right. Um, Okay, so so what we'll do now is we're going to compare with with the AI side of things. We talked about this earlier on, um, so hopefully everyone should be able to see that. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to to look at this. Um, there's some things we um, uh, we talked about earlier. So um, um, so when we talk about in, in a normal person, okay, we talk about these five senses, but we have more than five senses. Um, you know, they're, they're around 30, you know, you, you can even parse it into more than 30, um, but there are many, many more senses that we, than, we, than we think of typically. These are the five most common ones we think about. So if you think about it in terms of visual, um, when you see a static image, right, you see a scene, when you see a moving image, right, and using our, our eyes, we see an activity of things happening, we see a scenario, a world in front of us, um, and we might get an understanding of what's nearby, what's near, near us using our eyes, right, using a smell, Okay, and valence is, is a term of psychology where basically you, you, ha you have, you have um, a sensory input of either positive or negative. So, so either you smell something, you recognize it, you don't recognize it. It might be a positive smell or a negative smell. You know, for example, it might be a, a, friend, a smell of a friend or it might be a neutral smell or it might be a friend of a, of a threat, something like that. Um, so that's a static type of, of, you know, just you take a whiff, just one whiff and, and you have this instant um, sense of odor. But as you're breathing over time, in and out, in and out, in and out, that's a more temporal word. So the second column is over time, as you develop a more sophisticated understanding of the sense of smell around you. You might be able to smell what, what are things in the distance. You might smell the direction in which specific smells are, the location of things. You might be able to have an understanding of which animals are, are friends of yours now. Believe it or not, humans also, we can smell other people. Although this is not the the understanding part of it, the, the representation, the cognitive part of this is very weak in our, in our brains because we don't usually, uh, we consider, most societies, we consider it a negative to smell a person or, or to recognize the smell of a person. Um, therefore, we, we minimize this, but our body, biologics, is able to do this, uh, you know, although it's not as good as other animals, but to some extent, it does do this. And to some extent, we actually do use this in certain areas of our lives. Um, but anyway, it's there in our brain. And so if we're talking about a primate, it doesn't have to be human. Um, they would be able to smell other animals and recognize because we can smell, uh, this, for example, your, your mate, the person that you're married to, a person that you have a relationship with. Your, your mind will recognize their smell very clearly. It'll know whether it's them or somebody else. Your baby, um, if, you have, if you're a young, uh, you have a young infant and you're a new parent, 
you will recognize your brain to some extent will recognize the smell of your baby. Um, so these are, and, and the, again, the baby, baby very, very strongly recognizes the smell of their mother. Very, very strong. This is a very highly attuned, um, one of the first senses that develops in, a, in a, an infant in the first few um, days of life. And it continues into the first few weeks and then it starts to diminish. Um, so anyway, the sense of smell for an animal will be able to tell them whether, where their friends are around them. You know, they can smell one friend in this direction, another friend, you know, far away in that direction. And then we friend smell a threat, you know, coming from behind. Um, they may be aware of. So in their surrounding world, they have this, this sensory uh, sense of smell of, and in the last talk that we did, we, we looked at that type of a model of, of, uh, having a visual sense of, of smell, um, similar to audio, you know, you can have a single tone that you hear, a single sound that you hear, but using that, you can also, over time, you can get a sense of what sounds are coming from what directions, what they represent. If it's a, if it's, um, you know, the, the, uh, uh, uh gurgling stream, you know, water stream in, on, on the land, or if it's specific animals that make specific sounds, you can tell. So you can tell the distance to these and you can tell the direction to these. So that again gives you a better understanding of the world around you. Taste again is balanced the type of you know if you're tasting something, is it tasty, positive or negative, um, or neutral? Um, and over time you might recognize a specific food if you're eating. If you actually have a sense of taste in your mouth, you'll have a sense of exactly what food it is that you're eating. Um, and the understanding will be this object that you're chewing. What exactly is it? You're chewing you know um, this this specific fruit. Let's say, I'm um, intactal. Again, tactile will be balanced. It's there or not there. Um, it's positive or negative. So it might be the feeling of a, something crawling on your skin, on your shoulder, or it might be the sensation of an itch on your shoulder, which again can happen from something crawling or it can happen from nothing crawling. And so you might be, get a sense that there's some, an insect on your shoulder. That's the understanding that you get from, from this tactile sensation in your, in your body. So again, um, this is what, what people and organisms have. Um, in, in the AI side of things, um, for, for a, a multimodal um, uh, AI, um, they, they today can, can deal with text images, static images, um, temporal sound, you know, continuous sound and continuous video. And again, we had looked at this earlier in a, in a prior talk, but um, quickly we'll go through this, that um, the static column isn't as, as interesting, but the temporal column is where text can be, for example, closed captioning on, on, on a TV screen, let's say. That's text that's changing over time, right? You have to read it literally because it changes every few seconds. Um, a mathematical representation of text can be Roman numerals, it can be tables in a, in a chart or a grid. Um, image, a static image was a photo, but or a kaleidoscope, a moving image you know, can be can, can move over time. It's different from a video. Um, and a mathematical representation can be a graph or a bar chart. Those are mathematical, numerical um, ratios of, of numbers, ratios of concepts. These are our mathematical concepts that can be encoded in an image. Um, audio, music, speech. Um, you can have a 2D or 3D spectrogram, which is the mathematical representation of audio. Most of us can, but for example, on a, on a stereo, on a car stereo, or even your home, if you're an audiophile, you might have a bar graph, which kind of gives you, it breaks down the, the, the frequency bands of, of music, and you can see bass, and you can see treble, you know, at a minimum, and, and you can see high pitch, low pitch, etc. cetera. Um, that's, a, that's a spectrogram. And you can have a 2D version, which is common. You can also have a 3D version which changes over time. And in video, again, uh, movies and films, these are four uh, two-dimensional um, uh, video. And you can have what's known as a 4D spectrogram. It's, it's not as common, but it, it does exist. So this is how information is represented in, in um, uh, multimodal uh, models of artificial intelligence systems. They're not simply LLMs. LLMs will, will be restricted to only the first row here, text only. But the newer, more modern forms of LLMs, which are called LMMs, we, we talked about that in the last talk also. Actually, it may have been the talk before last. Um, and so let's go into some of that. So, so GPT-4 is one of the LMMs. And LMM is, is what basically is it's a large multimodal model. And what, what that means is large is the size of the network. Again, we're talking about neural networks. Brains and, and, and AI are all neural networks. They're a connection of, of neurons. Um, so these are very large networks. That's the L. M is multimodal in the sense that these networks accept input, multiple types of, of sensory input. So the original LLMs that we had, LLMs, the middle L was only language. 
excuse me, some of the only accepted language and the accepted language in multiple forms. For example, it could be text short. Some of them even accepted auditory language. Most of them only accepted text. So they were called LLMs. But the next advancement beyond LLMs is LMM. And we talked about it again earlier. I'm going to elaborate a little more now. So what LLM does is it accepts input similar to an animal brain in more than just one type of modality, in more than one type of sensory uh, uh, stream. So um, it can accept uh, visual video input, which video can be also static. It can be a static image, two-dimensional image, or it can be, um, if it's stereoscopic, if it has stereoscopic eyes, it can represent in form of stereoscopic sense. So it'll be two-dimensional, but it'll be stereoscopic in that sense. Um, it, can, it can get audio input. It can get um, spatial input in terms of, uh, you know, if it's a robotic system, it can get there are robotic uh, LMMs which um, can actually move physically and have a sense of that, although they're not that advanced right now. They don't have a lot of the other abilities. They're still in very early research phases, but they do exist. So LMM, the middle M, refers to multimodal or multiple sensory um, apparatus that they have. And the last M refers to model. And a model is basically that this network has an encoding um, that gives it a modeling or an, you can say an understanding. Now, it's not a sophisticated, it doesn't have to necessarily be a sophisticated understanding as, as a human being that has. It can be a more simple understanding as, let's say, a rat or a frog might have, okay, of the world around it. Um, a frog sees the world in terms of um, locations that are safe, um, other creatures that are safe, other creatures that are, are sources of, of food, um, things like that. It has a roughly simple sense of, of the world around it. It doesn't necessarily have nuanced um, understanding of that, that how can it climb that cliff up there, that to climb the cliff it has to go through this path and this path and this path to take this route. It doesn't, it can't figure that out because its understanding of the world is not sophisticated, even though it sees a cliff over there. It has no idea that the top of the cliff is a thousand meters above it, its per current level, which is ground level. It has no concept of that. Um, whereas uh, um, an ape, which can travel and which can actually climb, may have a more sophisticated understanding that a cliff is higher. And it may actually have an understanding that, that what a thousand meters means because it's able to climb a thousand meters. And a person definitely has that because a person lives in an environment where we have that. And so our network, our brain, encodes into its model the concept of height, not simply the concept of food and hot rock or cold rock or sunlight or, or nighttime, you know, these concepts that are that a mouse or a rat or a frog would encode, but we encode more sophisticated concepts than um, than uh, these uh, lower mammals and, and amphibians and other organisms. So artificial uh, neural network similarly encodes many types of information within it. And the types of information that it encodes within it gives it a level of understanding of the world. And again, this is a virtual world. This is something to understand that LLMs don't have a, a necessarily a connection to the physical world, okay? Because the camera system that they're using, if they're using a camera system at all, the camera system takes a simplified version of, of, the, of the images. Our, our eyes are actually much more sophisticated than a lot of the cameras, even though the resolution of these cameras may be, you know, a thousand or even a million times better than the resolution of our eyes. Our eyes actually do a lot more than simply high resolution. Our eyes do a lot more sophisticated things for example, stereo. Most of the, these LLMs don't have stereoscopic vision yet. They have just, uh, they basically have one camera, so they have one vision. So in that sense alone, our visual system is much better because it's stereoscopic. Our audio, auditory system is better because it also is stereoscopic. And a lot of these LLMs don't have stereoscopic audio or video today. Although that's probably one area where they'll be improved on in the next generation, um, especially when they're put into robots, because robots, if they need to behave as, as human beings do, or as animals do, they'll need to have some of the, some of the similarities that we have to our sensory apparatus. apparatus. So um, they'll be given stereoscopic vision, stereoscopic audio, whereas that doesn't exist today. So the models in these systems today are, are fairly simple. And also what's something to understand is that the models in these systems are, um, they, they, they really don't understand anything, okay? And, and, and one, one way to look at this is that what they're understanding is really, um, they, they only have, have tokens in them, that's it. And whereas, you know, if, in, 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 let, let me just go back to, to one of the previous slides where for, for a human uh, or animal brain, 
we have, um, this is very early. So when I talked about um, the early representation, so if you look at the, the middle, uh, the third bullet in this slide, so it says symbols, right? So symbols are, you can say the core idea, how the core types of ideas that can be represented inside that neural network. So in animal brains, this concept of a token, a token is a general thing, okay? Just, it can be anything that is an idea, okay? So it can be, in, in animal brains, the, some of the ideas that we all learn to, to, to represent are physical objects in the world, okay? We also learn to represent um, relational objects. So for example, your mom, mother and father and your children, those are objects, but there's a relationship between the objects, between that object and you object, okay? There's a relationship, so that relationship is another type of token that's a more advanced type of uh, object. And then there may be other tokens which are called goals, which I want to, I'm hungry. So hunger may be a state of being, which will, will not be a symbol, but it will be a physical state. Hunger will be a physical state, but that physical state affects the object of your body and the modification of the hungry nature and your body together gives you a goal that you want to alleviate the hunger. And so a goal is that you want to feed yourself. You need to feed yourself. So a goal may be another type of symbol or is another type of symbol that exists in animals. Okay. But these LLMs that we're talking about don't have these higher types of um, uh, tokens. Okay. They only have one type of token today. Now we, when we interact with them, we say, when we, when they write a sentence as a response or if they draw a painting as a response, we will say, we will recognize this token as one object and this token as another object. We'll recognize that. Okay. And internally, they'll, they'll recognize them as tokens. And in some sense, they might even recognize them as, as distinct objects. But to them, they're really seeing as a token represent, which represents this object, which, you know, and inside of it, it won't know the difference between a human being and an ape. Okay. It doesn't know the difference between them, meaning it doesn't have a name for the two. Okay. Although in one sense, it will have to have a name because it, if it, if it knows the English language, and that, that's actually the core AI system that does the drawing doesn't know the difference between a human being and an ape. It doesn't know the difference. But there's a second AI system that it's connected to, which understands the language, human language, for example, English. So when we type in, we're typing into the second AI and we're telling it, draw me an image of an ape shaking hands with a, human, with a person. Okay. So, so this language AI will have to understand draw, image, person, and ape. Right, it'll have to understand those tokens, those words, and, and token is, is 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 less than a word, but for simple simplicity's sake, we're, we're you know we're equating these. So it'll have to interpret those together, and the idea that comes out of that, it'll have to kind of translate. And it, in a sense, it already has been interfaced with this other AI because the, when these were generated together, they were generated together as a compound AI. They're, they're two separate distinct AI. They were developed separately, but then they were merged together. And that's what gives the advanced ability for you're able to type into, for example, Wally 2. Wally 2 is a system out there where you can type into it. Um, uh, draw me an HD quality photographic uh, image um, of, let's say, this size taken from a specific type of camera, right? From a Hazelblad camera, right? Uh, a 1972 Hazelblad camera, right? With this type of lens. Um, of a person and an ape shaking hands, okay? And so you didn't tell it the background. So it'll have to come up with its own background of this image. It'll come up with one, okay? You didn't tell it which hand it's shaking, left hand or right hand, but it kind of knows already that shaking hands means that one, one organism, one animal is using its right hand and the other is using its left hand. You don't see two, two animals shaking both of the right hands. That doesn't happen in shaking hands. So it knows the concept of shaking hands means opposite hands, right? And it knows that the hands aren't upside down, both hands are right side up. So there are a lot of things that's learned around, but it doesn't, the, the image part of the, of the AI doesn't have an understanding of left hand or right hand. It has a visual representation of the left hand and a visual representation of the right hand. And it, it simply knows it has this to take the, this visual repetition, that visual repetition, combine that. Because the language AI is telling it to do that, telling it to take from this organism one hand and the other organism, the opposite hand, because shaking hands means you take opposite hands from an organism. So shaking hands means the organism has to have hands. Okay. So it, in a sense, has to have this knowledge built into it. And this knowledge will be incorporated within, within tokens. 
And what I'm trying to say is that the, the visual token, the visual AI will not have an English representation at all. It won't know English at all. So it won't know right hand versus left hand. It'll have an image, it'll have the visual repetition of the left hand, it'll have the visual repetition of the right hand for a human, another one for an ape. Okay. And it'll have to pick out of its memory, you know, and it'll have millions of repetitions of a human left hand. Okay. And it'll have to kind of figure out one representation of the millions that it has, and it probably will be a, a, a collection, like it'll be a, a combined representation out of those million or a subset of the million. It'll take this combined representation. And it'll put it somewhere on the on the image. It'll do the same thing for the right hand of the ape, and it'll put it somewhere on the image. Now, if it happens to put the image of the ape's right hand on top and the human's right hand to the left, then that kind of sets the stage for what this ape, this image is going to be. The ape is going to have to be in this location. The human is going to have to be in this location, and it'll have to complete the drawing in a sense because it knows how drawings are made. It knows that a hand is connected to the to an arm, arm is connected to a body, etc. So that that type of information is in the visual AI, but it's all tokenized in a sense, not in English. Again, it's tokenized in a very different type of token system, and the AI which communicates with us in English that has a totally different set of tokens which have to do with English language, or if it's multilingual, it has to do with with multiple, you know, Spanish, French, German, all of the other languages, right? Um, so in a system like Wally 2, which accepts textual input, right, typed input from a human being, right, or from, from the inputting agent, it can be another AI that gives it a text stream, you know, another AI, like a more modern AI, might send it a sentence, and it'll interpret that sentence as using English, and then it'll, it'll set, get information into the visual system, the visual system will create an image, and that'll be output. So these are all aspects. So the token is, is the thing to understand is that in these AI systems, even today, they are basically working only at the token level and they don't have a more sophisticated understanding of the world. I mean, although that token understanding is quite sophisticated in the sense that they'll have billions and probably trillions of tokens. Okay, so for example, you know, not only will, have, will they have a token for the left hand of an ape, it'll have the left, left hand of an orangutan, It'll have left hand of a common ape, it'll have left hand of a rhesus monkey, it'll have left hand of a human being, it'll have left hand of a, of a child human being, it'll have left hand of a, of a child female human being, it'll have the, the left hand of a, of a child human being of a certain race, it'll have all of these tokens. And all of those tokens of a left hand will be distinct tokens. They'll all be separate and distinct. So when it has the idea that it needs the left hand of, of a Chinese female baby human being, Okay, that'll point to probably one small set of tokens, or maybe just one token, specific token out of billions of tokens that it has. And, and many of those, some of those tokens have to do with inanimate objects. Other tokens have to do with, let's say, vehicles in the world. Right? Other tokens have to do with, you know, um, the sky. So those tokens represent objects, the visual representation of objects in the world. But it doesn't have any other understanding other than a visual representation for for that token. So so what I'm saying is. Even though there's multimodality in these systems, the modalities are still tokenized, and the tokenization of it are single modality. Okay, and this is an important concept to understand. And what I, if, if you don't understand it, I'm going to pause in a minute because I want everyone to understand what the, what this means because it's very important for us, you know, later on as we as we go, not just tonight but even in future talks, that the tokenization is specific to a given modality. For example. If you're dealing with visual stimuli, um, then the example I gave of uh, Dolly, uh, uh, um, Dolly 2. Um, so Dolly 2 is, has a visual concept of a left hand, a generic left hand, which can be any type of organism. Okay? And then it has a more specific representation of a left hand of a human being, and again, it can be of any type of human being, and it has more specific representation of a human being who is male or another one that's female and of a certain age. And it might have another one of a male of a lesser age, and another of a male who is an infant or a baby, right? So that of a male human being, it had multiple repetitions of a left hand of different age groups. And then it might have other repetitions of different skin color or different races if there happen to be differences between the, the races in, in a left hand. There, there isn't, so it probably won't. Um, and again, it also depends on the type of training it was given. If it was given a training, if it was taught that the left hand 
of a Chinese person is different than the left hand of a, of a Yugoslavian person, which it really isn't. But for some reason, if it was told that it, there is, it'll tokenize that difference. It'll it'll remember there's a difference between Yugo, Yugoslavian human beings left hand and a Chinese human beings left hand, even though there's no difference. But it's being taught that, so it will consider that there is a difference. That's what we have to understand, that the representation it has, it's trained to have that, and the representation doesn't have to necessarily match reality. It's it's trained to have a virtual representation in one sense. And again, this representation, again, is all visual. And the same way, the audio version of this AI system, okay, which deals with audio, with sound, okay, will be trained in sound, and it'll be trained in recognizing the sound of a bassoon, and not just the sound of a bassoon, but a bassoon being played um, underwater, let's say, okay, because they will make sound underwater and the sound will be a little bit different um, versus the sound of a bassoon being played in a nitrogen of atmos atmosphere of nitrogen or a sound of a bassoon being played by a professional um, uh, musician on, on a, in a large auditorium which has echoing, so reverberation and other types. So that sound of a bassoon will be different than a bassoon being played in a small studio, um, et cetera, or, or a bassoon being played by a student who's just learning to play. That audio stream will be very different. So it'll have many, many different versions of, it, of just something called a bassoon. And each of those versions will be a different tokenized uh, um, uh, point of access. So this, so again, the tokens of visual will be different for the tokens of audio will be different for do tokens of other um, sensory streams, for example, balance. Okay, so you have to, that's what I want everyone to understand is that in these AI, everything is still tokenized, but the, the tokenization is at the level of the type of sensory system that, that we're dealing with. Okay, um, so that's important to understand. So we were looking at um, this. So, um, so GPT-4, first I'm going to describe GPT-4, uh, it's the official name right now is GPT-4V. Um, and this is a multimodal LLM. Um, GPT-4 is not multimodal. GPT-4V is the newer version. It came out in, in June, June or July of 2023. I think it was June. Um, it is multimodal, but it's a different type of multimodal. There's another one that I'm going to describe, which is a better type of multimodal. I'm going to, this is the reason why I want you know, everyone to understand about the tokenization, because this is important. And this also pertains to how biological brains, human and other animal brains, will function. So in this case, GPT-4V is a pseudo multimodal system. It, it, it works with multiple sensory stimuli. Um, but the way that it's been designed is that the system that works on visual was developed first all by itself. It was so it's purely a visual system. And then they developed another system which was purely audio. They developed another system which was purely uh, static image. Okay, and they developed all these systems independent of each other. And then they kind of combine them in, a separate, in, in multiple ways. So this GPT-4V is what's known as a mixture of experts. So each of these um, modalities is thought of as an expert. And it's actually the concept of expert is beyond just the modality of sensory modality. Expertise also has to do with knowledge areas. So for example, the area of, of physics, the area of law, the area of, of art, artist, uh, of, of uh, uh, dance, you know. Each of these also are areas of expertise. For example, movement, not necessarily dance, but movement. So each of these are also areas of expertise. So movement, for example, would be the sensory apparatus that we have for movement, as well as its knowledge of dance. For example, the words for dances, the types of dances, the motions of dances, the history of dances, the exact um, number of limbs that you need for a human dancer, you know, what, 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 how long a dance occurs for the rate and speed at which you dance, all of these things will be encoded in this one expert that's an expert in dancing. And it will have access to the sensory apparatus or sensory apparatus that are needed for dancing or needed for interpreting dance or maybe watching dancing, right? To understand by watching a video of a dancer, it would need to have the apparatus to, to understand that. So in that sense, there would be one expert for that. That'd be another expert for a video, for a visual apparatus. And so if, when they're combined, the visual expert, who is an expert at watching and understanding what it's watching, it will be tied, in a sense, with the expert that knows about dancing. And these two will work together. So when it's, when it's given a video of a person dancing, both of these experts will work together to figure out that, one, this is a video. How do I understand a video that's, you know, lots of moving images in time? So one part will try to understand this moving image and try to make sense of what's happening, all the scenes, all the individual frames. And the other part 
will recognize, oh, this is a dancer, and then it'll start to make sense of the dance, and it'll start to have an interpretation. It'll start to form tokenizations of exactly what the dance is about. It'll say that this is a dance from this particular um, dance week, and this is you know two minutes into the dance. Okay, it, it might have an understanding that, the, that how long this dance is, and we're already you know further into the dance. It's not the beginning of the dance. It's two minutes into the dance. And it might be able to realize that the next movement of the dance will be that this leg will move in this direction, this leg will move in this direction. So it'll have to two separate tokens for the mo future movements of both legs. So the expert of dancing will have its own set of tokens, which will, in a sense, have an understanding of the world it's seeing. And, and this video is its world, okay? And it's a virtual world. And so it'll have an understanding of this world and it'll have an uh, you might say a partial ability to even predict what will happen because dancing is, is time-based, it's temporal. So in dance, you can predict what the next move is. If you're an expert in dance, you definitely can predict what the next move is within a given dance. So this expert dancer system will be able to predict the next move, but the visual system will not be able to predict because when you're watching the video, you have no idea what's going to come next. There's no way for you to predict what's going to come next in, in any video. So this video system probably won't be able to predict um, other than it will be able to predict that there will be another frame Probably, um, you know, because because the video system will know that the video is either what's known as 24p, or 30p, or 60p, meaning 60 frames per second or 24 frames per second. So in that sense, it'll know that this video is a 24p video. So it knows that I've seen 22 video p videos. So there's two more videos within a given time frame, within a second. So before the second elapses, there are two more video frames that are coming. So this video expert will know that part of it. So in that sense, it might be able to predict a little bit that there are two more frames within this one second time period. So there's a little bit of knowledge about the world that each of these systems will know, and they'll kind of combine them in that sense. So, so this GPT-4V has 16 of these expert systems put together that gives it a sophisticated understanding of the world that it's been trained on, our, our world that's been trained on. Now, the performance of this system is superior to most people. It's, a, it's above the 90th percentile in pretty much every area. In many areas, it's above the 95th percentile. In some areas, it's actually at the 100th percentile, which we don't measure beyond, but it's probably better than the, uh, you know, the, the average expert. In, uh, in, and again, it's not when we say 100th percentile, it doesn't mean it's not, we, we can't measure it if it's above the topmost expert in the world because we don't have tests for that. You have to have that topmost expert quizzing the system to figure out if it's better than that person or not. And we, we haven't done these types of things yet, but we, we, we set a limit that 100% basically is the best of the people that we know about, of the experts in the world that we know about at a general level. But these systems are in the 90 to 95 percentile, GPT-4B is. And it's, uh, sorry, this is a comparable to um, Gem Gemini. Gemini is the next system that we're going to look at. as a typo here, the second sub-bullet to Gemini. So the modes of, of um, uh, the multiple modes that it works on is text, and as well as code. Computer code is, is a form of text, but these are two separate um, branches of, of the textual stream. Um, it can deal with images. It can deal with creating images as well as interpreting. So it can draw a new image, as well as it can look at an image and understand what, what it's seeing in an image. You can do both of those. For video, it can interpret video, and for audio, it can interpret uh, audio, understand what, for example, if it's, if it's listening to music, you can understand this is music, this is this type of instrument playing, this is this particular song or, or, or piece that's being played by this composer from this year. It might be able to transcribe it into, for example, if it's if it's in uh, um, C sharp, it might be able to transform, transcribe it into a different uh, type of music, you know, the same song but on a different um, scale. So, you know, so the expert of, of audio um, would have those abilities. So these are all things that are built into GPT-4V. Um, there's another system called Gemini, which again, um, this was developed by Google. Um, it, it, was, it just came out this month in December 6th, actually, so it's very, very new. Um, so, and, and these are the only two um, advanced LLMs that we have in the world that we know of today. Um, there may be ones that um, secret government agencies, you know, like NSA or others, may have developed. It's, it's not believed they have. These are the only two that are believed to exist in the world today, the best two, and they're comparable to each other. Um, both of them are superior to most people on the planet um, at several levels. They're very similar. Now, the difference, and, and they're very similar, the only difference between Gemini and, and GPT-4 is in the first bullet, and that Gemini is truly multimodal. It was designed from the ground up to be multimodal, whereas GPT-4B was not, because GPT-4B, the way it developed was, it was GPT-1, 1.0, which was a text-only model, 
and that was developed until GPT-2, GPT-3, GPT-3.5, and then GPT-4. And up to GPT-4, it was text only, and it was only one modality, you can say. And after GPT-4, it was expanded, and these other 15 uh, layers were added onto it, these experts added onto it, one being vision, and the name was changed to V, you know, for V. And so that's a, ex, uh, a suite of experts. So it's a different system. So Gemini is truly multimodal. It actually works much more similar to how animal brains work because our brain grows up in a multi-sensory, multimodal world and universe. We grow up hearing and listening and smelling and touching and feeling and all of that together simultaneously. We don't, you know, grow up with our eyes open and our ears closed. And then we spend 20 years learning how to see things. And then we go back to being a baby and then we learn how to hear things from, you know, baby to, to 20 years. We don't do it. That's how GPT-4V was trained in a sense. Gemini was trained with all of these systems active simultaneously and it's trained together all at once. So in that sense, its understanding of the artificial virtual world that it's trained on will be a little more like how animals see the world. It will be more realistic in that sense, even though the performance of it isn't any better than humans. It's, it's, conceptual understanding will match in a way better to what humans have. So, in, so for example, one example is that if you ask, so let me add, uh, this is the last slide, actually, oh, um, so yeah, so in terms of information output, so um, the information that's given into these systems, both these systems and uh, LMMs, is that they're given data sporadically. So, so basically you have to type into these systems. So when you type something, you hit enter, it gets its data. It's not collecting data continuously. So in animal brains, collecting data continuously. So in these systems, it's not doing that. Um, the data representation is statistical. Okay, and I, I don't want to go too far into this. It's changed over time. The original type of statistics in LLMs was different than the type of statistical modeling and, and representation in LMMs. It's just, but it's still statistical. It's a more sophisticated statistical tokenization, but it's still statistical. And the symbology of it is purely tokenized, although the tokenization is it is differentiated by the modality. So each modality um, has its own tokenization of it, and that adds to a lot of sophistication. We have the same thing. We we represent things using different modalities. For example, when we we when we sense an apple, we have a visual representation of an apple. We have the taste of an apple. We have the smell of an apple, whether it's sour or sweet, right? We have the weight of an apple, holding an apple in our hand. We have the you know, proprioceptory sense of an apple. If we throw an apple, like uh, as we throw a baseball, how would we, how would our body, you know, how would it feel when we're throwing or if we're tossing or if we're juggling an apple? How would it feel if we're juggling three apples, you know, or if we're cutting an apple with a knife? How would it feel the texture and firmness of the apple? All of these are different modalities of sens sensations that we have around the idea of an apple. Now, the key information here is that in the GPT-4 version, because the training happened separately and they were kind of tried to integrate together, the integration isn't very sophisticated. That's what, what we want to understand right now. So if you ask GPT-4V about details around an apple, it probably will be able to give you mostly accurate information, but you're going to start to see some errors in that. So for example, if you, if you type in information in English about an apple, okay, and you describe that that I just picked a red apple from an orchard. Okay, you type that sentence in. And then you give it a visual representation of the orchard that you picked it from. Okay, so that's a different modality. But you're giving me a similar information that there's an orchard and there's a tree with an apple, apples on it. Okay, except if you if that visual image you give it doesn't have red apples, it has green apples on it, but you typed in, I picked a red apple from the orchard. Okay it might not notice a difference. It might combine the two, and inside its tokenization, it might have two tokens for a green apple and a red apple. And then if you ask it, right, is the apple sour or sweet? Or is it a Granny Smith apple? The response will be, will be based on whether it thinks the green apple token or the red apple token is more prevalent. In that case, it probably will hallucinate and kind of guess between the two. It won't be because you gave it two confusing pieces of information. You told it you have a red apple, but the image had green apples. Um, so in that sense, it's confused. So the output you get will show that confusion. But with um, with um, Gemini, if you did the same thing, if you typed in red apple and you gave it an image of green apple, it will more than likely understand the confusion. And if you ask it, is the apple Granny Smith apple? It might respond saying, I'm not sure 
because because I saw a green apple, but you told me a red apple. It might literally understand there's a difference and that you're asking it a confusing thing. So it'll, the response won't be simple as in, yes, it's a green apple or yes, it's a red apple. It'll be more complicated answer in that I'm not sure and this is why I'm not sure. So in that sense, it un, its understanding of the world is more compound and comprehensive because the modalities have been integrated from the beginning. That's something to understand. And this is in the more modern LLMs as we're developing them, but this already exists in animals. So in that sense, these AI systems are becoming more sophisticated, more animal-like in that sense. So that's the idea that, that I, want, I want everyone to understand. So the conception in an LLM um, of an inner world. Okay, so the conception it has to have. So in this example, you told it, I picked a red apple from an orchard. Okay, and you, I didn't say a tree. I said the word orchard, right? And I didn't say apple tree, I said orchard, right? The sentence only had the word orchard. But this LLM has an understanding of English sophisticated enough that the word orchard is a word that's specific to some types of trees. For example, a banana tree, usually you don't refer to as an orchard of banana trees, okay? Or, um, a, a, you know, grass, you don't have an orchard of grass, right? Grass is a lawn, right? The word lawn refers to grass. Orchard refers to trees and certain types of fruit trees. It, you, it wouldn't be a coconut tree, for example. So the fact that I said I picked a red apple from an orchard, that sentence will give it a conception in its inner world um, of what I told it. And again, this is a virtualized world with no relation to the physical real world. Okay, Its virtualized world is only based on what it was described to it, meaning what, what the training that was given. So all of the training that this system was given, the text version of it, as well as the visual version of it, all the training that was given, as well as the text input that I gave it, I gave it information in that sentence, right? So all of that information that was given to it, that information helps it to develop an inner conception of, excuse me, this temporary world that we're dealing with. And then if I ask it something, it'll respond to me based on this temporary understanding that, that it has in this world. So the symbols, tokens, connections, interactions, the tokens, etc. These are things that it will have because they, they've learned because in the original LLM, the original LLMs learned that when you have tokens of words and the words can be multilingual words for a French word for, for a glass and an English word for glass are different tokens. Not only that, the French word for glass is eyeglass as well as drinking glass, as well as, you know, it might be um, a glass marble, right, uh, or, 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 or a sheet of glass, a pane of glass in a window, right? And so you might have three different tokens in French and three different tokens in English, or maybe in English there's, there's more than three versions of the word glass, so you might have eight versions of tokens for glass in English and three in French. And so when you communicate with this, it'll have to figure out which of these eight plus three tokens, these 11 tokens we're dealing with, or it might be two of them, it might be more than, more than one. And it might have to figure out the interaction between the token of glass that is in this world and another idea for example i said um you know tapped on the glass so you can tap on an eyeglass you can tap on a drinking glass you can tap on a window pane so the word tap it will probably interpret to mean window pane because that's more likely that somebody would tap on a window pane so it'll have to form a connection between the token of what tapping means and token of what glass means and glass in english versus glass in french so these symbols and tokens it's learned already, LLMs, you know, learned already, the connections and interactions between tokens, and these sophisticated LLMs also have learned the connections and interactions with symbology. And again, by that nature, again, these are models. The last M in LLM stands for a model. They are not necessarily created to be models, but they eventually become models because all of the information that's represented in them kind of creates this little mini world, okay, which sort of resembles a part of our real world, at least the part that we trained it on. And, and you know, the way we trained it using language and image, etc., is the reason why the model it kind of matches our world. If we if we if we train an AI with completely non-realistic images, so for example, let's say that we have artistic renditions of what Jupiter is like. Okay, and we don't know what Jupiter is like, although we do have some visual images, but they're very, very limited. Um, and it's mostly gaseous, um, so the images don't really give us much information. But um, if we had artistic representations of Jupiter, let's say we had a million different artistic representations of Jupiter, and you put all those artistic representations into an AI, this AI would have a model of the conglomeration of all of these million artistic representations of Jupiter, and it would think 
that this is a real thing. They wouldn't know that this is fake unless, you know, as part of the training, like there, if, if there's an English version of this AI also where you're teaching it things using English and that part of the training you're doing is that this is fake okay? and you've taught it that this repetition is fake. So it would have to know what fake means. The opposite of fake means is real. So it would have to be told what is real, what fake compared to what, right? Fake has to be always compared to something else. So it might have to be told fake compared to the real world. So it would have to be given some understanding of what the real world is. Or at least there's this virtual concept of a real world, which we don't explain what it is, but it's just there floating somewhere in its, in its world. That there's a real world. My concept is not real you know, related to the real world. It's different from the real world. That's all it knows. It doesn't know what the real world is. It just knows its reputation is different from it, whatever it is. So in that sense, you can have, you know, models that work sufficiently or that can be completely analogous to our real world model. So um, in the model, it'll have hierarchies of objects and things. And again, these are tokenized. So, so the glass token, um, so for example, um, a glass, you can have different sizes of, of, of drinking glasses. So it might have a hierarchy that a large drinking glass can hold a smaller drinking glass inside of it, a smaller drinking glass inside of it. So you can have hierarchy of drinking glasses and that there's no hierarchy between a window pane glass and the glass on a, on a drinking glass. There's no hierarchy between those. There's no relation between those other than they're made of the same physical material and the word, the English word that's used to describe them is glass. Although, you know, it'll also know that, that there's an adjective related to the window pane and that it's not just glass, it might be also referred to as a pane. Okay? That the word P-A-N-E also refers to that token glass. Whereas a drinking glass, it might be um, that th there's a there's a word called S-H-O-T, a shot glass, right? So a shot, um, that might refer to this drinking glass, right? But it, that the token S-H-O-T in English might also refer to a bullet being shot. So, you know, again, the complex interactions between all these tokens, because our English language and because our world is complicated, these hierarchies and relationships between them in this model will get quite complicated. And this is why these models are able to understand and represent a lot of sophisticated things in our world. So if you ask it a question about a shot and it figures out between, are you talking about a bullet and a gunshot? Are you talking about a bullet and a, or are you talking about a shot glass? Are you talking about an injection and a syringe as a shot? Okay, it'll be able to figure out which of these three you talk about, even though you use the word shot and they're all spelled the same way, it'll be able to figure out which of these you're talking about simply using the word SHOT because the model is sophisticated and it's been trained is sophisticated enough and these hierarchies and relationships and all these things have been trained into it um, to give it this ability. So anyway, let's, um, let's end here and uh, I want to look at the, um, you know, make sure that everybody has a pretty good understanding of what we talked about because we're going to expand on these in, in later talks. So thank you, Sanjay. Um, so uh, folks, it's running a little bit. We're running a little bit behind schedule, so we're going to try and uh, keep the Q&A brief. Uh, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat uh, or raise your hand in Zoom if you have any questions. Um, you know, I, I guess the the important thing that, I, you know, Sanjay, that I'm, I'm taking away is that the um, is the idea of understanding and how it's defined within, um, you know, the difference between uh, the first part of the 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 presentation, which focused on uh, different ways of uh, processing information, the mind processing information, um, and the second half of the presentation, which we actually focused on more AI systems, and one is more um, looking at a, a comprehensive uh, comprehension and and patterns. And is 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 and is looking for contextual information, uh, whereas there is the first half of the the presentation was more focused around the how and why how we process information, the psycho, uh, the psychological processes, the neurological processes that actually go into processing information, and why uh, somebody that has uh, uh, aphantasia or any other disability for that matter may process information differently um, and how they and how they they understand the world. And the second part is really how machines understand the world. Um, and so and again, that comes back to more comprehension uh, uh, basically uh, and, and contextual information. 
Um, and so more algorithmic based, uh, as you had mentioned, it has hierarchies and things along those lines. So I think that that's, I'm trying to, to kind of compare the two, two uh, present, like the uh, two uh, parts of the presentation. Um, what, what else, is there anything else that I may have missed in that summarization of? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the main ideas I think um, are important are that um, animal brain, so we're, we're comparing, we've been comparing and we're going to continue to compare um, animal brains, animal neural, net, neural networks, as well as uh, artificial neural networks. And the similarities are strong enough and we're, we will continue to see this as we delve further into the AI side of things. Um, so what's important to understand is that the neural fundamental foundations are in a sense similar. The, the biological side is much, much more complicated. We're not going to delve into it because we don't need to. Even at a simplistic level, there's so much similarity that, that we don't need to, you know, the simulation in the AI side doesn't have to completely match everything in the biological side. Also, the information is tokenized and the conceptual understanding and the more sophisticated understanding of the world of our body of everything is tokenized but in animals it happens in a much more sophisticated way um, it happens in a multimodal multi-sensory way from birth in animals whereas in ai we're only starting to do that now but the future ais uh, future llms and actually there'll be newer systems that won't all be called LLMs anymore. They'll, they'll have a different term in the future, probably a year, year and a half from now. Um, actually, next year, probably to the end of next year. But it's important to understand that the tokenization in LLMs right now are a little bit simplistic, but they're catching up to what animals do. Um, so if we understand what is happening in animals, um, we can, in a sense, understand what has to happen in the AI side of things also. Um, so these are the, the, the main um, takeaways I think are important. And I, I wanted to go, I won't do this tonight, but I'm going to branch just to give a, a thread, a, a, a leader. What I wanted to do and what I'm going to try to do is have visual representations of how the tokenized information is stored in animal brain versus an AI system. And also give examples of things like there's an idea around, um, uh, you know, in psychology, there's a concept of, um, uh, learning, Pavlov's uh, dog, right? That there's an association of one sensory input to a, to a sensory output. So the dog learns to hear and associate a bell with salivating. And uh, there's actually a simple example that I, that I think we're sophisticated enough now that we can show using actual uh, neurological processes in, in a very simple simplified brain um, to show what happens. And uh, even we can represent a fantasia in a sense, um, in a in a brain what might happen, but that's going to take time to to draw out and all that. It's I don't have the tools to do that as easily, but I'm going to try to do that next next time. Subsequent, not necessarily next next month, but subsequent to now. Fantastic! I uh, look forward to it. Uh, so we have a couple questions. We have DLJ, uh, who actually also uh, made a fantastic presentation. I may I. Why did I say my son? Uh, the Fantasia yeah. presentation. <laughs> it was, uh, early, no, no, no. The, uh, the, uh, um, the uh, designing the Dizan uh, mm -hmm. presentation a little bit earlier, uh, as well as Rich, uh, we have after that. Right. So it's a quick question. Uh, maybe a long answer. I don't know. Um, so, by the way, Joe, you just said aphantasia is a disability when Sanjay said it isn't. Because don't forget, I'm the normal one and you're not, right? But thank you for saying that. And that was a good correction. Okay. Uh, so the the token. So what is the unit? So in, in AI, we're talking about tokens in different forms, presumably made up of, um, I'm getting not just bits, right? Bit, bits or bytes, but strings, right? So strings of data, right? Um, so what's... Well, hang on before you, because I know you're going to go off. So, um, what would be the equivalent in the in the carbon-based system? Would that be it's obviously neurochemical? But are we talking about molecules, or are we talking about neuron? The firing of a neuron versus just the neuron? And yeah, tell me what is the to what is the what is the carbon-based token versus the silicon-based token? Yeah. So, so this is where things get interesting because they're basically the same in both systems, um, and I'll explain what what they are. So it's it's a cluster of neurons. Okay. So a token is represented using a cluster of neurons. Um, now the physical location of the neurons doesn't matter. It just has to be that these neurons, this cluster, is connected 
to, to one another in some way. And the interconnections, for example, you have a thousand neurons, let's say, right? A cluster of thousand and, and the thousand neurons don't have to be in the same geographic lo physical location. They can be dispersed, but they're connected together in some way. And it might, it doesn't have to be that every one of those thousand are connected to every one of those other thousand. It doesn't have to be that either. It might be that it's a sparse connection that maybe one neuron is connected to 20 others Another neuron is connected to five others. Another neuron is connected to 300 others, etc. So it's a very uh, sparse connection among these thousand. But in some way, every connection, every neuron is connected to at least one other. But most of them are not connected to the most of the others. So that's that's um, uh, the real representation that actually happens in biological systems. And we're seeing in the artificial ones, it's a similar representation, um, hmm. except the connection between the biological system and the artificial system is different. That the connection in a biological system happens in a much more sophisticated way. It happens using multiple neurotransmitters. It happens, it's, it, again, I don't want to go too much into detail there. And, and in, the, um, in the artificial system, it's basically two numbers that form a, a single connection. It's a, it's a weight and a bias. Um, but, but nonetheless, there's a connection, there's multiple connections and a clustering is the important part. So earlier in, in prior talks, I used to use a term called a state, and I never really ex elaborated on it because it's a, it's a quite complicated and it, it means many, many things. But we're starting to go in the direction of explaining what a state is. A state is a collection of clusters of neurons. Okay. So today we talked about a cluster of neurons being a token. And a token, if you want to have this, this um, intuitive understanding, is a token represents a single thing, a single specific thing in the world. Like, let's say, the left hand of a Yugoslavian man, a middle-aged man, let's say, okay? And again, left hands of men don't have to do with nationality, but let's say in this AI system, we've trained it doesn't, to... Can I quickly point out, Yugoslavia doesn't exist anymore. But other than that, keep going. Well, so, but again, in this AI system, it doesn't matter because the AI system doesn't have to comport with reality. Uh, Richard. Yes. Uh, uh, thanks, Sanjay, for a very interesting uh, uh, talk uh, on both of those uh, uh, related concepts. You you presented on two uh, types of uh, large multimodal models, uh, the GPT-4V, which essentially is sort of combining different modal models together and the gemini which is an integrated uh training that it, it is uh, on an integrated multimodal basis and the the sort of the implication is that the latter you know has the upper hand ultimately maybe um uh, but um, a question the, the first one the first model would it potentially have an advantage in that when you're combining different specialized models they don't all have to be the same type of um uh, uh neural network type of models you can combine uh the neural network and the language models for front end and other purposes with special purpose models which are like rule-based uh you know medical rule but you know in areas where rules might be better at least at the, the current state of, of development than uh you know pure neural network uh you know for black box and other reasons can you see that uh the development is going to probably uh, occur bo along both those lines for for that reason or that's not correct yeah, no, so that's excellent, excellent um, uh, points and questions. So I think you recognize that um, yeah, the, the difference between Gemini and, and uh, GPT-4V, um, that is correct, what you described. Now, the um, whether one is better than the other, I mean, my belief is that the Gemini model is better long term. It depends, on, again, what, what your goal is. Short term, um, GPT-4V does better in some areas, especially when you're dealing with specific types of expertise because it was trained much better and more in sophisticated ways in specific of those 16 expertise areas. So it does do better in some ways. But when you deal with information that crosses across those areas, it does worse. So in the sense of the multimodality, Gemini has an advantage because it was trained using that inherently. Um, GPT-4V has advantage because it was trained using expertise individually. 
Now, as far as the future, I think that, and again, um, I didn't mention this, but GPT-4V, um, OpenAI, the company, um, is has been developing GPT-5, its, its successor, um, and they've already been doing it for, for many months. It's, it's estimated that it'll come out probably early to middle of next year. So both companies are around six months offset from each other. Um, they can leapfrog each other every six months, and there, there may be other companies that there are other companies working, but no, no other company is at the level of these two. Um, so, um, in terms of whether expert systems, what are, traditionally were called expert systems in the past, in the 80s and 90s, we had those systems. Today, they're not worked on as much. But, and, and even in GPT 4V, even though they're called experts, they're not expert systems, they're, they're pure neural network systems. but the question you asked whether they're the same topology and structure of neural network, they're not. Um, a neural network that works with visual static images is a very different neural network than a neural network that, that works with audio or, or, or text processing. So they are different types of neural networks inherently, but all of these are neural networks. And even the glue between them, which interfaces and connects them together, there are other smaller neural networks in between these 16 models. So, so the GPT-4V system is huge and complicated. It's like a spider web right now. So the GPT-5 version, I, I mean, we don't know a lot about it, but I don't think they're taking the 4V and just building up on it. I think they started kind of what, what Gemini did, what Google did is Google, because Google also had precursor LLMs before that. It had something called La uh, Lambda and then had Palm 2, Palm 1 and Palm 2. And it could have taken those models and kind of extended beyond, but it didn't because there was, there was a, there were dead, dead ends and, and roadblocks taking that approach. So OpenAI will probably stop with GPT-4V, and GPT-5 is probably doing what uh, what uh, Deep, DeepMind did, Google's uh, subsidiary did, in terms of starting from scratch. So, so GPT-5 probably will use the um, uh, conformant uh, multimodal system that, that uses because that is more superior. Now, the difficulty is that that system is more difficult to train to get it to be an expert. It takes longer. Um, and once it's an expert, there still can be exceptions to it. So the traditional expert systems that we described, those are easier to, well, they're, once you get them to a certain sophistication level, certain accuracy and precision level, they maintain and, and increase above that, um, and they won't go down. But with an AI, once you teach it to become an expert, if you continue teaching it, its accuracy can actually decrease. So you have to be careful how you continue teaching it. So neural networks are, are it's similar with people. If you take a student, right, and you teach it a lot of things, and it, it learns it, and then you continue teaching it more and you overwhelm it, it starts to get confused because the new knowledge doesn't, the, the mental model that formed of that knowledge that you taught it, that all the new model doesn't fit in properly. It kind of has to find these exception cases. And so the original model that you taught the, the student doesn't allow the new information to come in and fit in tightly into it. And this is one thing that I learned early in my life is that this is why when you're teaching other people, you know, especially my own children, when you're teaching anyone else, you have to help them develop the right type of mental model early on so that the newer, newer information they'll learn later will integrate properly into it. If you don't give them the right model at the beginning, if you teach them later, it'll actually confuse them and cause problems. So, and this we see with, with LLMs and LMMs also. So that's the reason why a lot of these expert LL LMMs, like Gemini, if you continue teaching it, it degrades a little bit, uh, and you have to do a lot more teaching after, after which it rises up again. But okay. it's still the better, I believe it's just a better model, um, because expert systems, are they have kind of a, a plateau, and, and it's extremely difficult to teach them beyond a certain level. And, and they're very, um, they, they don't learn uh, sophisticated things as well. Like exception cases are more difficult, get more and more and more difficult to, to teach them. So that, those you. are really not being used, as far as I understand, in, in the sophisticated AI spaces. Thanks so much uh, for that, uh, Rich, and uh, thank you, Sanjay. Um, so, uh, what can we expect in the, just coming up in the, in the since this is the foundation for some other presentations that you're uh, that you're planning? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, what I what I um, what I want to do is, is uh, I want, I mean, there, there are basically three things that I, that I do in these talks, and, and which of the three I'll do next, I'm not sure. I, I probably will do something more, like tonight, I actually did something more traditional neuroscience, like aphasia, uh, uh, aphantasia, and, and, and I also combined it with uh, the AI side and, and kind of had a little bit of link between the two to help people understand each of the two and, and why 
because a lot of people still don't inherently understand that the fundamental element of a neural network is what provides everything to do with including consciousness, at least in my understanding. Um, uh, so one of the things that we're going to talk about are the traditional areas of AI. We'll continue in those areas. We'll continue in the areas of traditional neuroscience. And then the third area that, that I is an interest of many of us, including me, is consciousness and free will and, and these higher order behaviors in, in humans especially. Um, and we're going to try to tie all these together as we, you know, these, these three blocks I'm trying to raise one at a time. So sometimes I might raise this one, another time I might raise this one. Another. So as each of these get raised higher and higher, you know, we'll start to see the similarity converge amongst these three areas. Fantastic. So uh, thank you again, Sanjay. We'll look forward to that next month. Um, and uh, for upcoming events, we have... Um, so, so, so far, Joe, one, one, thing I, one thing I do want to, before we go to upcoming, so I want to mention that our talks, uh, uh, neuroscience talks, have been typically the third uh, Wednesday of each month. Going forward next year, from January onward, it's going to be the fourth week. So just anyone who wants to uh, keep track of it, we're going to be one week later. So if you're looking forward next week and next, the third Wednesday won't be there, it'll be the, the, the following week. That's right. Fourth. It'll be the fourth Wednesday of the month. Um, right. So... Uh, with that, um, we have upcoming this week. I appreciate that announcement. Um, this Thursday, we have The Power of Myth by Joseph Campbell uh, and Sacrifice and Bliss, part one. I believe that's being led by um, Ebony Kishikon. Friday, we have Who is Christ? Ten descriptions from Gregory, the theologian, or or, 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 or uh on the sun. And then, uh, then we don't have anything until actually next comprehensive is Wednesday. Um, so, uh, happy holidays to anyone uh, in the audience um, that may be celebrating this weekend. And um, I hope to see uh, everybody soon. Okay. Thank you very much.